welcome to everybody joining in on this video and watching in. My name is Tony Busy Beckwear. I'm editor in chief of Wonderland magazine, and welcome to the House Become series with Wonderland and BFC. I am joined by the gorgeous, gorgeous Jawara. Now I don't even want to call him a hairstylist because I just think it just doesn't describe what he does and his work. But you know, common terms or whatever, in layman's terms, he's a hairstylist, pioneering, legendary one. And I'm so happy that you're joining me. I've been okay. I mean, I think it's been up and down. There's a lot of things going on in the world. I'm optimistic about change, so. I hate to describe it as crazy, because, but I don't know any other word to describe it. We're living in some crazy times, but I think like, for some reason it feels like not. It just feels like the year of a reset. It's not like, you know, you see all these memes about mm -hmm. everybody being cancelled, but it just feels like it's all, the, the whole world has just gone through a reset in terms of culturally, in terms of environmentally. And so I'm, I'm doing good. I'm kind of positive too, because I feel like some sort of shift is happening due to what's been going on. But I kind of think people are finally like holding people accountable and we're now living with more integrity than we was before and more compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. I do feel like definitely there's a shift that's happening and I think it's definitely up to us to continue to create that shift and to wake people up and have them understand how important this is and how much of a change there needs to be. So, you know, feeling really optimistic about that for sure. And how have you like been staying creative like during this time as well? I've been mood boarding a lot. I've been doing a lot of self-care as well. But um, in doing that, I found out that, you know, I have to kind of put my ideas somewhere. So I've been mood boarding a lot. I have done like one or two projects during the quarantine time. Um, I have recently decided to, to come back home, hang out with my family during the quarantine. And so I've become like a, I call it uncle quarantine because I'm, I have nieces and nephews. And, you know, now that I am home a lot more back in New York City, I've been spending a lot more time with them. So recently for Vogue, I was asked to to send a picture that was going to be published of like what my quarantine looks like. So, you know, use my creativity again to just kind of like do my nieces and nephews and like take pictures of them. And I think that, you know, that meant a lot to me because they have been my heroes during this quarantine. So that's kind of how I've been staying creative and just building and reading and educating myself just to try to be a little bit more equipped to do all the things that I'm trying to do once this is all over with. So. That's how it's been for me to quarantine. You know, everyone I'm speaking to, it seems like they're like not reconnecting with family, but having that more fa like having more family time. I can see that yeah. everyone's just, you know, you forget when you're kind of moving from job to job, editorial to yeah. editorial, campaign to campaign, show to show. Right. Like, you don't have time for family most, like a lot of the time when you're... Right, and it, and, it, and it feels good not to be on a schedule, but just like I feel like, you know, this quarantine has forced me to stop and sit and focus on like what's important to me. And, um, you know, I have always been really close to my family, but I travel quite a lot between Europe and America, back and forth and all over the world. So this quarantine has made me just, you know, decide to leave London where I live and come home and just, uh, you know, regroup with my family while we're in a global pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, we've grown a lot, even more closer than we were before. And that's what my quarantine is up like and I'm very thankful about that. I'm thankful for that for you too but I'm sure London definitely definitely misses you as well. Yes I miss London too. <laughs> Back to baby Gerard what was it like growing up in Jamaica? Oh Jamaica was one of the most amazing places for me to grow up. I don't think I would never change my childhood for anyone. You know I was born in New York, flown to Jamaica at about three months old, grew up in Jamaica at a time where it was like the height of the dance hall culture era, reggae culture era. So for me, it was very vivid and colorful and, and, and just exciting and a lot of music. I just remember a lot of music, a lot of great food, a lot of dancing, a lot of just excitement. And I think for a kid, that's like really, really a good place to grow up. And I just, I just remember it just being like a really, really great place for me. I lived in a house with a lot of older women. <laughs> so a lot of my life choices were kind of like advised by like what I would hear them say as a child. And, and now that I'm an adult, I'm realizing, wow, they were so wise beyond their years. And, you know, it, it, it's really, it's really looking back at my childhood. I'm very, very happy to have run up in Jamaica during that time. It was insane. It was food everywhere, dancing everywhere. Every, every day there was a party, every day there's something else going on. Um, I just remember elaborate outfits, incredible hair like undescribably incredible hair that, um, you know, as you probably can tell, inspires me today. So it's a great, it was a great childhood. 
yeah, I, I love that you touched upon obviously dance and culture because it's influenced fashion so so much. It's beyond like yeah, absolutely. The amount of editorials that I see sometimes and just even wrong ways. Yeah. Yeah, and also also a lot of pop culture artists, like just the mannerisms, you know, a lot of them I remember coming from that whole dancehall culture where it's raw and provocative, but it's beautiful and it's artistic and it's like, you know, it can be punk, it can be goth, it can be all those things in one <laughs> in one way. And I think that, you know, dancehall culture has definitely impacted a lot of what we know as pop culture and fashion. And, and you know, I think that to know that, and to understand that you would understand why I'm saying that. It was definitely an amazing time. And obviously, you know, coming from a Jamaican heritage, why was that so important for you to kind of infuse that into your work as well? I feel like for me, I'm never gonna do anything that I'm not truly authentically being myself. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I, you know, later on in life when I came back up and graduated, went to school and everything, I decided to go more into the salons. And then from the salons, I went more into to assisting in the session world and editorial world. And I just didn't really see any representation of that. Um, and I think that understanding black hair culture and Jamaican hair culture is it's so sophisticated. It's, so, it's such a complicated way of doing hair that I felt like it would be great to fuse the two of like what I learned in the session world together and what I learned from earlier on what in Jamaica, those techniques. And, you know, that's kind of what my work reflects now because that's who I am. So I've always just tried to stay true to what I am and where I'm from. And I feel like, um, you know, touching on Jamaican hair culture is so, 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 like, so, so amazing. I remember growing up also, you know, my mom going to hair salons in South London and getting her hair done and, uh -huh. you know, you know, you for example, you know, in terms of like you go to West Africa to do the braiding, and basically you knew what you were getting when if you went to like a Jamaican hairstylist or whatever. Like, right. People have their niche, and it's so interesting to just talk about certain techniques I used to see even growing up when I was sitting in the salons and for hours waiting for my mom to finish. You know, just drawn to like the techniques that we use, and it'd be just so raw and so passionate. And, and the point of view was always out of this world. Like I remember being a child, being in my aunt's salon day after day after day. I just loved seeing the woman come in with one attitude and leave with another attitude. I'm um, coming in kind of sad um, of whatever's going on in their life and leaving is very happy. And I think that like just watching them do these gravity defined hairstyles with hair colors, cuts, Jamaican hair culture is definitely has set itself apart for me from all the other cultures that I've seen and, 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 and been a part of and, and it's amazing it's amazing you know in terms of just kind of early on in your journey do you have any like specific maybe hairstylists or specific kind of women that you saw that the hair was amazing that kind of was a catalyst we, to be really honest my aunt her name was Vanetta Bailey she her clientele was uh <laughs> consisted of all different types of women but I just remember a few of her clients were like really heavy dance hall goers and these women, they would get their hair changed every few days. They didn't believe in wearing an outfit more than once. They didn't believe in having their hairstyles for too long of a time because I think that they had so much going on with them that they kind of wanted to express it through hair and clothes. And one of the things that they loved is to show up in those dance halls and um, just being amazing. They Sometimes they looked so otherworldly. It was just so insane. Um, you know, she, my aunt was definitely one, the first person that influenced me with hair. Of course, my mother who is a reggae singer. So I grew up around a lot of music as well. I'm an amazing reggae legend. Later on in life, I was influenced a lot by the hair that I saw in music videos. Um, and I remember like really falling in love with the work of Chucky Amos and Oscar James and hairstyles like that. I started to look at like fashion magazines and fall in love with the work of Guido and Sam and Luigi and, and you know, is what like always inspired me. And Sam McKnight was a big inspiration for me as well. I kind of pulled from everywhere in a sense. Yeah. And um, just look at raw style and talent and, you know, emerge myself in a lot of different cultures. And, you know, um, my parents are Rastafarian, so we grew up with a lot of African inspired culture around us, you know what I mean? Actually not inspired, we grew up in African culture. My name is African, everything was, I pulled from everywhere to be honest with you, because I believe I am all of those things. So it's, it's that's kind of what I would say influenced me and my style and all of that stuff. I mean, my parents are Nigerian, but my brother's uh -huh. dad was a raster. And I used to remember he used to come to my house with this like floor length 
dreads, like literally. At the time, I just thought, it was like, oh, he just likes to wear his hair longer than like you, when you actually hear, yeah. you know, behind locks and why. Yeah, like what's behind it, it's so yeah. much deeper. I feel like, you know, I've been visiting London for years before I moved in. I just feel like every time I go to London, there's such a melting pot of African diaspora mm. there. Um, you know, when it, Africans, Caribbeans, just a lot of people there, a lot of cultures, a lot of things mixing. And I know a lot of people are like half Nigerian, half Jamaican, half Nigerian, half Ghanaian, half, you know. So it's like, uh, London is very that. That's one of the reasons that inspired me to move there. Now, you moved back to New York. How was that experience? I moved back to New York. It was very interesting because I had a really heavy Jamaican accent. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember being in school and having always catching hell for that. And then mm. out of nowhere, it was like, the Jamaicans are cool. So then that just switched. You know, hair was always a part of my journey. It's something that I naturally wanted to do. I played sports when I was younger and then I deviated from sports and went into hair. And, and I would just do hair on anyone that would allow me, you know. And at the time it was a very interesting time for boys to do hair. So, and I remember my sister going to school one day. She's 14. I'm doing full head weaves on her and i think that i was like 16 yeah 16 and i think she was at a bus stop one day and a woman that owned the salon stopped her and was like who did your hair and she was like my brother and she didn't believe it so she brought me up there the next day and said yeah he did his hair she did hair so i, did, I started like a in, little intern apprenticeship with her my cousins in florida also owned the salon and my mother realized okay this is what you want to do all right go stay the summer in your cousin you know go stay the summer in florida with your cousins and they like they own salons so i was like oh this is what happens when you become a hairstylist you can like like, lived this amazing life, fell in love again with hair um, from a business aspect. Like they owned a chain of natural hair salons called Natural Trendsetters, um, Simone Hilton and Trudy Hilton, my cousins. And I just thought that was so amazing. And from there, I graduated high school and I went to FIT. I had a love for fashion as well. I wanted to, somewhere in there, I wanted to be a fashion buyer. So I went for international fashion merchandising and buying. <laughs> And went to FIT for four years, graduated, ended up still doing hair because I just loved it because, you know, it's one of the things that I love so much. And um, one of the things I always wanted to get into since I was a teenager, I would read Vogue and Elle and ID and, and all the other magazines and, and especially like Wonderland. And I would be like, who did this hair? Like, how, do, how does that work? How does that world work of who does the hair for that? And I'm, for years and years and years, I would wonder and would never know. And I would find out who did the hair, you know, back, this is an AOL when you had to wait for dial up to, to go on the internet and surf who did what. <laughs> and I kind of fell in love with the people who were doing hair at the time that I just appreciated. And I wanted to get into session world. The only way I knew how to get into that is contact the agencies. And I used to just call or email over and over again. Did that for about a year before I got an answer back or was taken seriously. And that's how I got into the session world. So my transition from, you know, being raised in Jamaica, doing hair in salons in Brooklyn and in Queens when I came back to America and then going into the session world, that's kind of how it went and then how did you fall into like assistant like because obviously you've assisted like some heavyweights in the hair game like how did that even come about well i mean i kind of assisted simultaneously while going to school here and there like i would do a show a shoot here and there but after i was done with school i wanted to go fully into it and i was working in a salon in harlem called salon 804 where i had my own clientele i was my own master stylist but i said i want i want to be able to do more so i went back in as an assistant, which is a very humbling experience. <laughs> and um, I started assisting Guido's team on shows, Luigi's team on shows. And then I take an, I've taken a real, like eventually I took in a real liking to Sam McKnight, who is just like one of the most sweet, amazing people in the world that, you know, really inspired me to take this thing and go far. I don't know, I, I was persistent. I was persistent. I just kept reaching out to agencies. I remember one time reaching out over and over and over and over again and not hearing back. I would pay for a flight and I'm like, that's it, I'm going to Europe without getting on any confirmations on being in any shows. And I would like send all these emails before I got on the plane and I would land in Milan and I would get a, okay, you've been from, confirmed for Fendi and you've been confirmed for <laughs> Moschino with this person and you've been like, and that's kind of like how it started. And that grew into like actually being on Team War and, and mm -hmm. That's kind of how it was. I was a bit persistent. I didn't want to take no for an answer. And that's what I did. I just, just kept going, 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 going. And I was a sponge. I soaked up everything that I could learn, anything. 
um, even if it's something that I know I can do, or even if it's something that I felt like I can do in a different way than somebody was doing, I soaked up everything. It was a really, really great time for me to learn that and do that. And I encourage people to assist because it's life changing. I feel like your whole answer just summed up in terms of just even advice. I was going to even ask you what advice would you give, but it's, it's already been said. It's I think now things are a bit different with social media. You can kind of, you know, reach people a little bit. You can kind of see people's lives a bit more than when I started. The younger people now will have a bit of an advantage that we didn't have. I always am an advocate for assisting internships and apprenticeships and, and just like really working under the person that you love if you admire what they do. But I do feel like you can pull and learn. I learned so much about the business of fashion and how it is to be a session hairstylist and being a, a LLC. And you know, it's, it's way more than hair. So I really do suggest assisting for sure, 100%. And then in terms of just like breaking away from a system, when was that moment that you knew that you were ready to kind of just like do it on your own and just go for it? I think for me, it was in 2013 or 14, I think. I was kind of being repetitive and doing the same thing that I was doing. And I was sitting on a lot of other skills that I haven't seen in the session world that I felt like need to be seen that I've learned in my previous hairstyling world of working in Harlem, working in Jamaica as a child. It would be great if I fused those two together and, and put it out there. I haven't seen that. I started doing some soul searching and was like, you know what, you need to go. I was extremely nervous, but what I did was I just kept shooting. I kept test shooting, to reaching out to young photographers. I kept reaching out to people that just wanted to shoot and create. And I think sometimes with doing that, you learn that hair in real life is different from hair when you're shooting it. So I learned how to do hair for the camera as opposed to like doing your hair to look nice to go out. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of taught me a lot. I think it's really important to assist, then test and test and test and test and test until you can't test anymore. And from those tests came pictures and they started getting noticed. That's kind of how I got represented and signed and, and, you know, I wanted to take my time with certain things, but certain things kind of happened fast because I was so adamant about testing over and over and over again. I put my own money into it. I would pay for things. I always believe if you believe in yourself, just continue to, to, to put money into it to support yourself. If you do have support, that's amazing. But if you don't learn how to support yourself and push yourself. Even times when I was starting out, I would also, put money into like if there's a particular look that I want or you know mm -hmm. these little things at the time it was like damn I'm spending my money but then when you look back you're like you know you're investing in yourself which is so so important if you can bet on yourself that's the best way to go you know what I mean like there's nobody who's going to fulfill that and like do an, a return on investment better than you I'm sure seeing you now at all the shows front rows doing amazing being editor in chief of Wonderland I'm, I'm sure you probably look back and say to yourself, you know what, that's a good thing that I invest in myself. I remember one time people weren't flying me out to Europe. I would have to go work in a salon for hours and hours and hours and use a lot of that money to fly out and fly myself out and put myself up and just be amongst what I wanted to see and, and record. And that's how it was for me at one point. And I think it did good for me. How would you describe your aesthetic? My friend, Carlos Nazario, he years ago he used to make jokes saying um i was bougetto <laughs> i used to think it was a joke at first but actually i think i have an aesthetic that pulls from different different backgrounds i think that it has a chicness to it but then it has a certain tough streetness to it being able to dabble in both lives and 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 you know i put them together sometimes it's a bit weird sometimes a bit off hard hitting culturally and it resonates with certain people because people understand i think it's comprised of many different things but if i was to put it in one word I would say Bougetto. I love Bougetto. I love it. Yeah. I love Bougetto too. You know? Definitely. When you're delving into your ideas and you're doing your mood boards, what's your process like? My process is crazy because I am a reference junkie. So I collect, 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 collect images. A screenshot king, number one. Number two, I go to libraries, moving to London, actually. I used to go to the London Fashion College Library Fashion all the time with a friend, Liam Warwick. You know, we would just Xerox old fashioned magazines all day, Vogue's from 1930, um, culture books about Africa, fashion, art, jewelry, everything, just like Xeroxing it. Uh, I'm a Pinterest junkie. I'm an old movie junkie. I watch old movies. I watch old shows. Um, my friends like to joke and say that I am a source of <laughs> an encyclopedia of cultural references because I remember every show that I watched, everything that, like certain 
sayings from shows and stuff like that, I keep it in my mind. I don't know why. It'll just be in a conversation that randomly comes out. I like to keep a lot of things in my mind. And I think it reflects in my work. I'm a sponge. I, I pull everything in. For me, the creative process is so intricate because it could be it can be anything from something involving social media to something involving an old book. I collect old books. I collect old posters. My new thing now is to collect Black Panther posters. I don't know why. But <laughs> it, 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 it just depends, you know what I mean? Like I watched old videos of reggae battles, dance hall battles, like everything. Anything that I can find inspiration from, I just watch and collect and just kind of put it in my computer, in here, or in, you know, my physical reference. I mean, this is why I just don't call you a hairstylist. Like, it's really, <laughs> well, even when you speak about it, I'm like, even I'm getting tips, I'm like, God, I need yeah watching xyz but you know visual artists you just kind of keep your eyes open you know that's the main thing you just it's so crazy because people like laugh at memes and i'm always screenshotting memes because like the crazy hair that somebody has in the memes or like you know there's one that's like what you got versus what you wanted and what you wanted is always like the messed up hair <laughs> and i'm always screenshotting it, like wait a minute if this was like this, that would be cool, you know. So it depends. I get my I get my inspiration from many different places. Now, also, you've been celebrated on some amazing lists. I mean, BOF five hundred, special mm -hmm. council, new wave creatives, two thousand nineteen. Mm -hmm. This is you know some heavy stuff to be attached to your career, and I feel like you've still got so much more to do. And I'm, I'm so absolutely, excited. absolutely. I don't even feel like I've started yet. No, exactly. But, you know, these accolades are heavy. I mean, how does it feel to kind of have these accolades attached to your career so early on as well? It feels good, but sometimes I'm surprised because I feel like I still haven't really shown my point of view to the fullest yet. So it, it's a humbling experience that, you know, it is reaching people or it is being recognized. Um, and and it, it feels good. It feels good, to be honest. I, I haven't really seen much of that in the market, so it feels good to be recognized for that. And I think it's great because it's, it's, it's an indicator that the times are changing and I would love to see more of the change happen. So if my work, which is based off of me and my culture and where I'm from and how I see the world, by all means, you know, I, it feels really good. I think it's great. And I think it was also just a testament that how representation is so important. And it just makes me happy to know that, you know, someone like you is on this list, but also a younger you could be, you know, baby Gerard on yeah. your journey will see <laughs> It's possible, but so you know, you've got FK Twigs, you've got Cardi B, you've got Solange, uh -huh. Michael Stallion. I mean, the list goes on. <laughs> How do you feel each client has pushed you in terms of creativity? For me, working with celebrities have been a major part in my life that has pushed me as an artist to understand things outside of fashion or just like regular beauty, like understanding image and how people want to be represented as it relates to hair. Every celebrity client that I've worked with have definitely pushed me to become a better hairstylist. Understanding them, understanding their needs, understanding how they want to be viewed has, has added to the way I see things and the way I see the world. Working with Solange, who is one of my favorite people in the world, has definitely pushed me. Um, she's such an artist in her mind. And when she sees hair, it's not just hair. It means so much more that it has me it pushes me to think you know, on a different level than just let's do something that looks pretty or let's do something that looks nice. You know what I mean? Um, I think that working with her has definitely, definitely shaped a lot of the ways that I, I view hair now and, and, and beauty now as it relates to, to people. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I would love to work with more celebrities if our spirits mesh. <laughs> I'm big on that. I'm big on that. So, but I think that, um, you know, definitely enriched my experience in this industry of creating with artists and creating with other people and collaborating. Touching on brands that you've worked with now, again, heavy, heavyweight list. I mean, mm -hmm. Chanel, Hermes, Off-White, Alexander Wang, Moogler, like, number one, you just struggle so much, which is just so commendable. And it's so amazing to see well, how do you prepare yourself creatively put myself in the mind of like i have tried to have conversations with the client over and over and i always try to imagine how can we put a new spin on something how can we say something different that's never been said before but or even if something has been said before how can we make it different like for example with that alexander wang shoot alex is so good with references as well and he just started talking to me about a group named total <laughs> and i was like 
Alex, that's like one of my favorite groups in the world. And he was just like, remember when I was like, and I just finished the sentence and I was like, oh, you mean like when this and that, and the, I think the idea kind of matriculated into like beautiful short hair, shiny, glossy is one of the aesthetics that they used to have, like really short, cute hairstyles. And, and I kind of like took that and took that to the next level, you know, which I don't know if that's a group normally that someone in those particular rooms would be talking about. So it feels good to kind of understand things on a different level sometimes, as opposed to just like a fashion. And you know, I'm I'm a I'm a person I'm a I'm a child of the culture. So it's like I think what I like to bring to the table with each client is having them understand that there's different ways to look at things, mm -hmm. as opposed to how things have always been looked at. I try to go into every meeting and on every set just thinking differently, thinking outside of the box, thinking things that we haven't seen before, and. Um, feels good. It feels good to be able to connect to clients in different ways. Describe hair sometimes is so like, wow, we're really talking about this in a <laughs> fashion house like Mugler. It's so free, it's so raw. And that feels good that that's where things are now because I connect to that. I know you did an exhibition in London called Talawa. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. I did an exhibition in that we debuted at the Cobb Gallery in London with one of my dear friends, Nadine Ijuari, who is a photographer by trade, but a visionary to me. It was a conversation that we started after doing a few jobs together. Um, she wanted to explore her culture and I've always wanted to do a project based on what I saw growing up in Jamaica and how amazing people were. Also how the hair culture relates to people individually, how it's more than just hair is more than just hair in black culture period. So I wanted to do a nod to that and she did as well, as well as trying to find out more about her heritage as part Nigerian, part Jamaican. So we went to Jamaica and we documented some hair, some hairstyles, and then some of it we kind of like fantasized and some of it we kind of made a little bit more like rugged and, you know, just like different moods that we were feeling and going. And I think it's just, that's a brief explanation of like what I and her felt like hair means to us as a people. And I feel like it resonated with a lot of people because we haven't really seen these images in galleries and looked at as art. And I think that, you know, just the, just the practice of black hair is so artistic and so sophisticated, so amazing. I kind of wanted to shine a light on that. I think it got pretty good reviews. I'm trying to bring it to New York, but we'll see because there's a lot going on with this pandemic. So a passion project of mine and Nadine's that, you know, really set the tone of like what I would like to see in these rooms of art and fashion and style that, you know, I would love to expand on that a bit more. Hopefully you guys will see, stay tuned. And there's so much beauty in in the culture that I feel like hasn't been, there's a lot of times the culture is always uh, captured in a negative way, in a violent way. And I kind of wanted to change that. I kind of wanted to, to, to do a beautiful approach to it, a soft approach to it, a sophisticated approach to it. It's so beautiful, it's so artistic. Let's capture that. And that's what I tried to do with Talawa. In terms of just, you know, going back to a few more advice questions, what advice would you give to kind of young people that are out in the industry that want to gain like agency representation? I think for me, it's, First and foremost, research. I always pride people on just doing your research. Like if you want to go into a field, if you want to do something, it's good to know what's going on, what's the, the atmosphere of that field like at the moment? How do you fit into that? Or how can you break away from what's going on? And going back to assisting, I think assisting is extremely important for people just starting out in the industry. Assisting is extremely important. I know that a lot of young people feel like, uh, I'm better than that. I don't have to do that. But it's like, you know, it's one of the building blocks of what makes you a better artist, a better business person, and also just persistent, just be extremely persistent. You know what I mean? Like what I've been told over and over again, I'm not supposed to be doing the things that I do because I'm just gonna be a one hit or quitter. Or uh, sometimes I've heard, you know, well, I've never seen someone like you do that. So how, what's that gonna look like? You know, and I'm, that's a nice, I'm being nice about the way it was said. Persistence is key. I like that you keep saying assistant because I know I do, I get it as well. Sometimes people look at it like, I don't have to do that. I already know how to do hair. It's not about doing hair. This message is so much bigger. I think assisting is one of the big things too. I always also tell people to find your own voice. What you don't want to do is assist someone. And then when you become your own artist, you're just replicating the same work. Find your own voice, find out what speaks to you. Next thing you know, you're a version of whoever the hairstylist or whoever it is. Find your own voice, find what speaks to you, find what makes your soul move. Because I'm sure there's a lot of other people that it connects to as well that have probably not seen something that connects to them. So, you know, what's different about what you're doing? How is it, what light is it bringing to the world? 
world? How is it making things better? And, you know. Also, just any artists watching that are maybe on a budget and they kind of want to start building like a kit in terms of when it comes to hair and all these sort of things. What would you kind of suggest in terms of what you should kind of have in your kit? When I began working in the session world, I didn't really have a full kit per se. But what I did is I made what I had work until I was able to develop it. Don't feel forced to feel the need of building up your kit overnight. You know what I mean? I think that's something that takes time, especially if you want quality tools, um, invest in yourself. If you don't really have the budget, by all means, don't force yourself to buy things. I remember doing shows, seven tools, and I would sit next to someone who had custom leather cases for their brushes and then custom leather cases for this. And then everything was monogrammed and gold and they couldn't do hair. So... <laughs> Or they couldn't do here like me. So I think for me, it's it's one of those things where, you know, like don't look left, don't look right, just focus on what you have. If you have two things, make those two things work for you until they can bring more. Um, that's kind of what my story is. I used to go to sets and things with like what I thought I needed and I would crank out so much more people and ideas with what I had as opposed to someone who was like fully stocked in kit, but always put some money aside to kind of build yourself and you know do it gradually don't go with anyone else's rhythm go with your own if that's what you could afford and do at that time that's what you do one at a time little at a time and you know it'll work out for you yeah it's so so important to go with your own flow and just like you said don't look left don't look right just be you and just go with that journey yes maybe this is a hard question but do you have a favorite hair moment that you've created so far. No, I don't. I love all of them. You like all three? <laughs> I love all of them. I do love, I do love Talawa. I do love the stuff that I did with Solange. And I do love, there's a Vogue beauty picture that I did with the Nigerian hair wrapping, stretching technique that I loved. And, and, and you know, I think for the most part, like those three are kind of like one of some of my favorites that I've done. But sometimes I have so much in my mind that I want to do that I can't remember what I've done until like somebody posts a picture or something like here by Joanne. I'm like, oh, I, yeah, I did that. So <laughs> it's hard. It's hard for me to answer those questions. Wang was a good one for me, too. The, the, that campaign was really, really cool for me, too, because I feel like what we were trying to convey, it was so good to feel that uh, through the pictures. It was interesting to see that in a Wang ad. So as far as a favorite, I don't really have a favorite. I wish I did. Fine. The favorite is yet to come. The favorite is yet to come. So I'm working on a couple private projects. So hopefully you guys, you know, stay tuned and I promise I'll find a favorite in that. London Fashion Week at the moment is digital. I wanted to talk about what is it that you kind of love about London and London Fashion Week during that time? London has a vibe that I don't think you can find anywhere in the world. It's filled with artists. It's just a whole new outlook on expression of self and fashion and art and music. And I think it's been like that, you know, for a while. I personally believe it has a lot to do with the melting pot <laughs> that London has to offer, filled with so many different people from all over the world. And there's such a feeling there, I think, that inspired me to move there. It's a big deal for me that London has been a bit of an inspiration for me. It's like an awakening vibe, you know, like going to the shows, um, going to, to the different events in London, the galleries. It's filled with so much art and so much expression that, you know, you're overwhelmed with like information. And it's amazing. It's an amazing place to be. That's why I live there. And I know you do a lot of backstage work at shows and stuff like that. How is it when you prepare for those sort of things? I shut down everything, put on my headphones. I listen to music that makes me feel like I'm a teenager again. So I listen to the things that I used to listen to when I was a child, one of them being um, some old Jay-Z, some Emil, some Foxy Brown, some Little Kim. Then I go into like dance halls and that reminds me of my childhood and I listen to Beanie Man and Bounty Killer and like all those people. And I kind of just shut off everyone and just listen to my headphones and it kind of makes me feel it reminds me that I'm resilient in a weird way. The music just makes like playing that music really, really loud just reminds me of how far I've come and how far I want to go. That's my mode of meditation for shows because there's so many people asking you so many things. There's so many people coming to you. Uh, you have to deal with a client. You have to deal with assistants. You have to deal with other hairstylists. You have to deal with a makeup artist. You have to deal with the stylist. So I want to be in a, I call it my to-go mode before I show up to any set 
or show and stuff like that. So kind of that's my process for shows. Great, because it's so, so yeah. important to kind of, even if it's that five, 10, half an hour you have to yourself. Yeah, I mm-hmm. always do it in the car on the way to shows. And anyone riding with me knows, just don't. <laughs> I just need I just need five minutes to hear my music. It's been good for me because it kind of gives me an adrenaline rush to go in and just kill it. <laughs> go in and kill it, not kill. In terms of the industry, how do you feel like the industry has like evolved and changed when it comes to like diversity? I feel like we've definitely made strides, mm. but I do feel like there's a lot of work to be done. I think that what's happening right now is going to be very important in where the future of our industry goes. I think a lot more people are going to be held accountable. I think a lot more plans of action are going to be set into place. Actually, I hope a lot more plans of action are going to be set into place. But I do know anything involving me is going to definitely have to be completely different and have some type of plan of of action attached to it. I told myself I'm not going to involve myself with any company or anything that we don't share the same views. And, you know, I think working in this industry can be very draining sometimes for people of color. And I do believe that. I think if you stand firm in your beliefs and understand how important you are and how amazing you are and how much this industry needs us, people will fall in line. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm waiting to see what happens, to be honest with you. And if I can do anything to make that happen, that's what I'm going to do. And I feel like that's my personal uh, obligation that I've made for myself that I would like to 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 see more of that. So we'll just see. I'm, I'm trying to work on some things, but we'll see. <laughs> all these things that you keep on mentioning, all these secret things. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to see what these secret things are. I definitely am. Um, yeah. And in terms of just the future of hair, where do you see the future of hair going as well? I feel like this quarantine, people have been locked in houses. They want to come out and they want to be creative. They want to see do different things people here have grown people have shaved their head off i think that this time has definitely changed a lot of people and to be honest i don't even know if i can predict where hair is going but i do know it's going to be a lot more creativity and people are going to do things that you've never seen them do because they've been put in a situation that they've never been in before and now self-expression is going to be taken to the next level once the world is back open and we're out you know i do believe that sometimes the way you see people is going to change there's going to be a lot of experimentation with hair i've already seen some of it so i know and i'm already thinking of some of it so i i do believe that there's going to be experimentation with hair i think so too i think people are ready to step out honey i know i'm definitely i'm I'm here dressed up and i'm sitting at home i'm ready i'm ready to step out out too and look good and just enjoy life and really live absolutely my hopes for my career used to be to get to a place where i can see people like me doing what i'm doing but now for me i think it's changed my hopes for my career is to continue to make art and continue to collaborate with the people that i love but i do feel like within my career it's my duty now to pull up other people as well to pull in other people to give them other chances that I probably necessarily haven't gotten. And I'm thinking very selfless when it comes to stuff like that. And, and, you know, the hopes of my career is that I can use the platform that I've been privileged to get to, that I've actually not been privileged to get, that I've worked hard to get, but it's a privilege to have it, to shine some light on some other people that I feel like, you know, probably would not get the same. One of the things I want to do is create forums, create opportunities for a lot of other people as well. Grow together. You know, I think it's terrible when someone just does something and just thinks about themselves. And, you know, of course, people work hard to get to where they are and, you know, have whole careers. But one of the things that I would like to do with my career is open up that conversation. You know what I mean? Shine some light on things that have never been shined before in fashion. Um, And this is not to make people feel uncomfortable. This is to help people. So... That's one of the things I'd like to do in my career. I mean, I think you're doing it already now, even just talking to me on this platform, because imagine the amount of people that will watch this, or even if it's just that one person that watches and gets inspired. Absolutely. Step in the right direction. So, I mean, yeah. you've been angelic as always. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That means the world to me. And I do want to take this time to tell you as well that um, I'm sure you know this. I've told you already. I'm extremely proud of you as well, because I remember first meeting you on set and now you are this huge entity behind, <laughs> behind uh, you know, just like one of the leading editors in our community, in our 
industry that I feel like has done so well for herself and have so much to say and have so much to contribute to the fashion culture. We're proud of you as well. Oh, thank you, Joara. That's don't make me, don't come here trying to make me blush. <laughs> this is about your journey and your moment, okay? You know, you, you use the word huge. I mean, I won't say huge yet. So, you know. We have to pat ourselves on the back sometimes and, you know, we're proud of you. And I'm proud of you. <laughs> so, and on that note, thank you so much for joining me on the VFC X Wonderland How to Become series. Mm -hmm. the outro, I'm Tony Ricky Beckwear, editor in chief of Wonderland magazine, and I've had the gorgeous Jawara. Okay, that's how I'm going to sign it off as. So I love you. that. I love the hair visionary. Thank you so much, Jawara. I'll see you soon. Bye.